friends. When it comes to allyship, something Izu said really early on when we were working together is no one can self-identify as an ally. It is up to the person to whom you wish to be an ally if you are being one. It's kind of like friendship. Like you have to co-sign on that. You can't just be like, hey, I'm your friend. If the other person's like, mm, I don't know, we only like, like, like each other's stuff on social media. In our fast paced world, it's easy to get swept up in the currents that surround us. But we are the authors of our own life story and we are infinitely capable of creating the change we want to see within us and beyond. Welcome to Shaping Freedom, a show where we explore and share practical ways to cultivate extraordinary life experiences. I'm your host, Lisanne Basquiat. I'm a teacher, entrepreneur, and life strategist. After a career as a corporate executive, I embarked on my own path of entrepreneurship and focused on the human and spirit connection. I come from generations of trailblazing entrepreneurs, artists, healers, and champions of human dignity. Today, I am beyond thrilled to bring you a conversation that I had with an amazing woman who is a successful speaker and not just an author, but a change maker in the realm of racial dialogue. Hannah Summerhill recently co-authored, along with Iso Mukantabana, a groundbreaking book titled Real Friends Talk About Race, Bridging the Gaps Through Uncomfortable Conversations. This book is a testament to the depth of her commitment and courage to create spaces for uncomfortable yet essential conversations. Before her work with the Kinswomen and as an author, Hannah contributed to several major fashion and lifestyle magazines, including Condé Nast, Vogue, and Cosmopolitan. In those roles, she witnessed a stark lack of diversity and discrimination against people of color and noticed that there were not a lot of decision makers at the highest levels. So she was inspired to dive deeper into the issues of race and social justice and decided to help bring these dysfunctional issues to light. She took action and she co-founded the Kinswomen, an anti-racism platform that fosters community, dialogue and understanding across racial and cultural lines. She also co-hosts the Kinswomen podcast, which explores the intersection of sisterhood, inclusivity and social justice and her own podcast, The Hannah Summerhill Show. Hannah, like me, is an East Coast native, and together we delve into discussions about race, the power of sisterhood, the courage it takes to discuss race and other sensitive topics within our friendships. We shared our personal journeys from childhood perceptions to the evolved understanding that we each hold now. So sit back, take a deep breath, and prepare to join us on a journey that's as personal as it is powerful and as inspiring as it is informative. Hannah. Hi. I am so excited. Hello. I'm so excited to have a conversation this afternoon with a woman who I met last summer, I think, at a mutual friend's, at actually at Mashanda's house. Mm-hmm. And um, and there's kind of an interesting story to the way that you and I are connected yes. that we can talk about in a moment. Um, but I'm really excited to have this conversation with you because in during this party that we were both at, we somehow or another started having this conversation about uh, a book that you wrote recently mm-hmm. uh, or that you were going to publish. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you kind of chatted about it and I kind of noted it. Um, and then very recently, while on social media, I saw that you had finally um, published this book. Yes. And uh, I remember in the conversation that we had um, that you mentioned that you really wanted to have this conversation about race. Um, and, and then I saw your book. And so the person that I am being so mysterious about is, uh, her name is Hannah Summerhill. And she wrote a book that was recently published called Real Friends Talk About Race, um, Bridging the Gaps Through Uncomfortable Conversations. And so, uh, I am about to have a conversation with Hannah Summerhill to talk about this book and to talk about you and how you got 
to this place and all the great, great things. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Hannah Summerhill to the Shaping Freedom with Lisan Basquiat podcast. Thank you so much, Lisan. I am so happy to be here. I actually am a huge fan of this podcast, so it's an honor to be a guest on it and to talk to you today. Thank you. And I think I hit you up in DM and I was like, hey, want to get on my podcast? Yes, Let's talk about did. this book. Yes. Yeah. And you were like, yeah, I'm all about it. So I'm really, really excited Thank to talk you. to you. Can't wait to get into it. Yeah. So I guess a good place for us to start. Well, first of all, I, um, I've i not read every single page in the book. I'm going to. Uh, so full disclosure there. But I have flipped through it and kind of saw what energetically kind of came up for me. Hmm. And uh, one of the very first things was the fact that I didn't realize that you were born and uh, raised in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Yes. Yes, I am. Are you, I know you're a fellow East Coaster. I am. I'm from Brooklyn originally. Yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah, I, I'm born and raised in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And if you know anything about Allentown, and I kind of go into it in the book a little bit, um, it's it's a gritty, a grittier city. It's most famous, it was made famous by Bi Billy Joel's song in the 80s called Allentown about mm -hmm. how... Um, you know, there was a, it was the end of the steel mill in the neighboring town that really uh, left a dearth of jobs and kind of depressed the area by the time I was born in, in the 80s. So, yeah, I had an, I had an interesting background um, growing up in Allentown, but it proved too small to me and I quickly made my way to New York for college. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's funny. My daughter, uh, Jessica, actually went to college very close to Allentown. Uh, Where? She went to DeSales. Lasan, stop. My mom worked there for like 25 years. Whoa. We have to exchange names and I'll <gasps> see if my daughter, uh, if my daughter knew again. Oh, and I actually so re crazy. did read in the book some really beautiful things about your mom and about her intention yes. uh, that hopefully you can dive a little bit into. Um, and uh, yeah, so my daughter did the reverse. She grew up wow. in a very diverse area and went down to DeSales and went to school down in Allentown. So I'm very familiar wow. with that area. That is such a small world. That's it crazy. Is. It really is. So let's talk. Let's see. How do we um, dive into this conversation? Why don't you give us a little bit of the background? Like who is yeah. Hannah Summerhill? Let's yeah. talk about that. Who are yeah, you? Sure. Yes. So as I said, I'm a girl from Allentown. I f I'm a white woman and a Jewish woman, and uh, I'm the oldest of three girls. I was born in 1987. I'm a Pisces, and I was raised by parents who I think, like a lot of liberal white people, would call themselves, you know, very open minded. They taught me not to see color. That was kind of the ideology that I grew up with. Um, and it wasn't until many years later that I really started to investigate what that meant and kind of how that was more of a privilege than um, something to be proud of. And when I moved to New York I'm, in 2005, I went to college on Staten Island and I always felt like I just needed to bust out of the town where we lived. We moved to a tinier town closer to Amish country out of Allentown when I was in middle school. and. The way that I got to get a glimpse of what a bigger world looked like was through magazines. I was obsessed with the magazine industry, and my sisters wouldn't be allowed to touch the magazines before I had read every page. I would read the credits and the ads and immerse myself in what I thought was a world that was so much grander and, and cooler and more interesting than, than the one that I was living. And I got to manifest my dreams when I moved to New York. I went to college on Staten Island and I would take mm -hmm. the ferry into Manhattan um, and started interning at Condé Nast when I was in, um, in about 2007. And then I never, I didn't leave the magazine industry pretty much until 2020. I related so much to your last guest's journey of being in the magazine industry and then leaving. Ty Bouchamp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to stop for a second to talk about magazines because I have yes. to tell you, 
I lo- I have not read a magazine in a, in a little bit of time and uh, shame on me for that. What I love about the experience of a magazine is, first of all, the way it smells yes. and that kind of flipping of the pages and how smooth the pages are. And then I also love how you go in there and like you get to like test out the newest perfume and, yes. you know, and the ads and it kind of gives you this viewpoint into the world. And I'm putting that up in air quotes as the magazine intends you to see the world. And I think that right. so much of our view of the world has come from the view that people, the window that, you know, different magazines offer. Absolutely. It, I mean, not as much now, but it was such a powerful medium, even up till, you know, 10 years ago. And I was so influenced by it. And thank you for bringing that up. It is such a tactical experience. And I think something people don't really remember. One of my, my bosses used to say, it's the last, it's the last notification free space. And I would argue that books are probably more so because they don't have ads in them. But the sentiment was it's really it's an immersive experience. And I think we like the media we consume now really enforces the sense of immediate immediacy. And we have such short attention span. So I'm I still subscribe to magazines and I miss that that feeling of diving in and. Fortunately, the fragrance advertisers aren't spending as much money in magazines anymore, so you don't get those scent strips as often. But yeah, it was a magical, a magical experience. And so, being able to work in that industry and feel like, you know, I I, I started in in the fashion closet of Lucky Magazine, and then worked my way up to a senior year internship at Vogue, and then never left the industry. Was was um, grateful enough to get a job working at Shape after I graduated, working in advertising okay. sales. And I did that for mm-hmm. about 10 years until I left to do what I'm doing now, which is um, Kinswomen. Well, it's really interesting because having gone from the experience of growing up in Allentown and then moving to New York City, the big city of New York, you know, uh, and then immersing yourself in fashion through magazines, right? In mm-hmm. fashion, in fitness, in, mm-hmm. you know, in, in beauty. Uh, it really does give you this idea different from like social media, which does the same thing in a different way, mm-hmm. right? It does give you this idea of who you are, you know, kind of right. helps you to solidify an, uh, who you are from, an, you know, your identity and mm-hmm. also the way the way that the world looks at you and the way that you are to look at yourself. Oh, absolutely. I felt like not only had I been shaped by magazines as a reader and consumer, but then as an employee, I felt like the stakes were so much higher for me to conform to what I thought I was supposed to look like. And Mm -hmm. even though I worked at women's magazines run mostly by women and geared towards women, the humanity of being a woman and the spiritual aspect of being a woman and the sensuality of being a woman is so devoid from environments like that because of course the structure it's built into a very capitalistic patriarchal white supremacist structure of working and of um, business and I know you're you're familiar with that from working in the corporate world for so long Absolutely. how yeah the irony of like doing something that's for women but also feeling like you're your womanhood is not really respected and that you have to look like a very specific type of woman to fit in. The irony and the dissonance definitely led to, you know, what what Ty was saying on the last episode, a burnout for me. I understand that. I can definitely understand that. And also, you know, it's like you're celebrating womanhood, but only as it relates to your physical right. attributes and the mm-hmm. ways that you are encouraged to contort yourself yes. to this certain view of, you know, w- what beauty looks like. Mm-hmm. And then in, in, in parallel, for women who moved more into like the corporate, you know, landscape and worked within corporate environments, kind of taking away your womanhood mm-hmm. in a way. Like, mm-hmm. it's like you're supposed to be like this like sexy woman with like long brown or blonde hair and Mm -hmm. blah, 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 and and ultra, ultra thin. And then, you know, also within these corporate environments to act 
in many ways to perform as a man. And yes. so it really has done a thing to us as women, you know, in the world. Um, so continue your story. I'm sorry. I just like really got caught up in the, in the magazine thing. Yeah. No, like this idea that you bring up of contortion. I remember there was a headline when I was working at um, Shape on the cover. For some reason, I always remember this headline. It was eat, drink, and still shrink. And there were so many headlines like that. Snappy, memorable. But the message obviously is that we must be smaller. You know, we must, we like this, the goal is always to be shrinking ourselves, conforming ourselves into something that's usually very uncomfortable for most of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's a literal instruction, mm -hmm. but also, you know, it's, it, it's also, um, you know, the, the kind of metaphorical where it's like shrink, you know, yep. shrink both physically, but also shrink yourself. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit before we dive into kind of what happened then for you, uh, two things. One is we, you talked a little bit in the book about your, there was an experience that happened in the car with your mom. And I think you titled something about colorblind. So to kind of help us to fully understand kind of what I understand, like the idea of being a liberal, you know, Jewish woman, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how yeah. race was introduced to you or not. Yeah. Yeah. So the story that you're referencing, when I was maybe seven or eight years old, we went to pick my sister up from her dance class and she had a crush on this boy that she'd talk about all the time. And I would always tease her. And when we picked him, picked her up, I got a glimpse of him for the first time and he was black. And I said, oh, mom, you know, Brian's black. I just hadn't expected him to be. And I said it as just, you know, stating a fact. And my mom got so upset at me. She whipped around in the car and started crying and said, I love that your sister doesn't see color. And oh, wow. so that was an early misguided race lesson for me that it's impolite to say black, that it's not okay to see people's color, um, or it pretend like you're not, you, you must pretend like you don't acknowledge the fullness of somebody's identity or, or at least that aspect of it. And so later in life, as I grew up, I thought, wow, my mom, that was so progressive of her. But mm -hmm. fast forward to meeting my husband, David, who you've met, um, who is a black man in my early 20s, I was really confronted with the privilege of that statement that for a white person, it's easier to say that because we have the privilege, like the privilege of colorblindness, and I say privilege in quotes, is really so erasing to, mm -hmm. or could be erasing to other people. And it wasn't until falling in love with and you know, meeting and living with and just creating a life with my husband that I was really confronted with my own whiteness and what does this mean? And um, recognizing that it's not neutral, that it's not this default race that our society has kind of made me believe that it is. And so that led to my work with the kinswomen. And uh, I can, I'm happy to dive into that and share how I got from magazines to doing what I'm doing now and writing this book. Yeah, I'd love, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I do want to, um, two quick things. One is that, um, and I guess you will talk about your, I'd love for you to talk about how you met uh, Isu. Isu, yeah. Oh, Isu, thank you. Yeah. I'd yeah. love for you to talk about how you met Isu. Uh, and I did not realize that you actually met her at the place that you did meet her. So I'd love yes. to talk about that. Yes. I do want to share really quickly with you that I was actually raised in Brooklyn by a, my father was Haitian and my mother was Puerto Rican. And it's really interesting that in my household, um, we were raised in an upper middle class area in a Borum Hill, Brooklyn. And there was a ton of diversity in the world that I lived in as a child. And the programming that we got was and programming for those you know programming is really as children we are being programmed to think certain things and to see the world in a certain way uh similar to what your mom's 
intention was, which was for you not to be a racist person, you know, but there's programming that happens in there. And so for me, it was work hard and not to really pay attention to the color of my skin mm. or, and my brother's and sister's skin in what we were doing in the world. So the messaging for us was, you're a Black woman, absolutely be proud of that. And it doesn't matter. What matters in this world is to work hard, you know, and prove yourself to yourself and all of that. And so I walked into, stepped into my adulthood with that programming, which led me to, to believe initially that, well, you know, that doesn't matter. What really matters is what I do. And then I was confronted kind of on the opposite end of what you're talking about with other people who really did see my Blackness as a primary attribute um, for who I am and, and how I show up for them. Uh, so I just wanted to share that, you know, it's kind of, I think it, it's worth it for all of us to kind of think about like, how were you introduced to this, this um, debate or this thing that's happening in the world, mm -hmm. you know? Well, first of all, yeah. I want to say thank you for sharing um, about your childhood. And I recently finished the book that you wrote with your sister um, as part of the exhibition. I got it after seeing the show. And oh, wow. Yes. And I read it cover to cover and I just loved um, learning more about you through that. Yeah. And I thought it was so, so beautifully written. And um, yeah, learning about your childhood and your family dynamics was, was a, a gift. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So now you're in the world, you're in the city, you're you're still in the magazine industry or yes. the publishing industry, or are you now? Okay. So now yes. what happens next? So in the mid, you know, when I met Dave um, 10 years ago, I, I started to have this awakening. Um, it was like a mirror being reflected back to me of my own, um, like the harm net, the harm that whiteness can cause, the privilege that I have, the privileges that I have that I didn't realize, um, the ways that my husband, then boyfriend, would move through the world and things he'd have to, to double check and overthink about that I would never give a second thought to. And I just, you know, I started to examine my beliefs that I grew up with, started to really question them, started to have deep conversations with him. And that led to more inquiry about what the racial dynamics looked like in my workplace um, and in my friend groups. And so in 2018, I joined The Wing, which was a women's only social club in New York and, and all over, actually. And at the time, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. It was one of the most intersectional spaces I'd ever been a part of because I'm coming from a very corporate world. And so I really enjoyed being around young professional women. And I went to a talk in, Jan I think it was January of 2019, called Bridging the Empathy Gaps Between Women of Color and White Women. And there I met Izu Pulfleet Mukantabana, who is my partner in Kinswomen. And at this event, I sat in the back quietly. I didn't speak up. And at the end of the event, Izu got up and anybody could speak. And she said, you know, all these white women are just sitting here and not contributing. It's not a conversation. It's your, it's more of a voyeuristic thing. And I thought, wow, she's right. I totally messed up here. And so I approached her and said, hey, I would love to continue this conversation if you're open to it. Um, a few of the women from this evening we're going to meet in my apartment in a couple of weeks. So we started having our own gatherings every month, um, building trust, having transparent conversations between women of color and white women. And at first it'd be like four people, six people. I would bring some of my friends, my colleagues, my family members. Um, she would bring hers. And it, then it just grew and grew and grew till we had hundreds of women coming to these events. and. During that time, we thought, well, only the people who are here can hear the, these dialogues. How about we start a podcast? So that's how the Kinswomen podcast was born in 2019. 
And then in um, 2020, I decided to leave publishing to focus on kinswomen full time. And then we, you know, got a lot of attention in 2020 as we had this, as Izu calls it, a racial big bang for white people uh, after um, the death of George Floyd. And we were offered a book deal in 2020. And then we've spent the past three years working on, on, on the book, which is called Real Friends Talk About Race. And it just came out a month ago. So uh, it's really exciting to have it out in the world. But it has been a journey, a beautiful journey, but also a, a crazy journey of getting here. Congratulations, first of Thank all. Thank you. Uh, congratulations to you and to Izu uh, for having the courage to, in your friendship, create a space for people to also talk about ways that they can have those conversations with other people. Um, I, in looking through the book and reading certain passages within it, I love that it really reads like a conversation between two friends who are talking about both shared and separate experiences, you know, in the world. I also love the fact that I love the titles of the different chapters that you have as well. Um, they're very bold. I really appreciate your, both of you, how courageous you are to be willing to not just have those conversations, but to get out into the world and publicize it and create uh, these conversations for other people. So I really do see, you know, book club conversations about it and, and uh, you know, hats off to you for pioneering those conversations because I don't know mm. that I have ever seen this topic spoken mm -hmm. about as openly and as publicly as you and Izu have chosen to do. So mm -hmm. I, I really commend both of you and hope that at some point I have the opportunity to commend her as well. Oh, um, thank you. So what, so you had this, this, you got this offer mm -hmm. to do this book and, and the book is very well done. I mean, even talking about, I know that tour, you know, you talk about the inner work, you know, mm -hmm. and I'd love for you to maybe, yes. you know, um, talk about that a little bit because I think that yes one of the things that I've recognized is that the conversations around the ways that there's a conversation about what's politically correct mm -hmm. and about racism and about allyship and then there's a conversation about how you take that from these kind of like words keywords mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, that are used or trending topics, how you bring that down into the real world mm -hmm. so that people can have these conversations with each yes. other. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that process for you too. Like how did yes. you approach this process of, or your response to this offer to write a book? Yes. So I felt an, an extreme sense of responsibility uh, insecurity, vulnerability about the opportunity to write a book about anti-racism as a white woman who has never directly experienced racism. So in the book I write, I am an expert only on my own experience and what I can offer to white people who are reading this book, hopefully is learning from my mistakes. I try to be as vulnerable as possible about all the ways that I've messed up in the book so that hopefully people who read it who are white can learn a little quicker than I did and and cause less harm. But the book is I kind of as as you alluded to, it's written from both of us in the first person. So it was really important because we have such different experiences. Um Izu has grown up in uh Rwanda, Burundi, Belgium, and the US and is a very interesting global background. I was raised on like a few city blocks in Allentown, like we could not be more different. So it was super important for us to speak in, in the first person. And then the text, our, our voices are delineated, delineated through, through um, different fonts. And when it comes to allyship, something Izu said really early on when we were working together is no one can self-identify as an ally. It is up to the person to whom you wish to be an ally if you are being one. It's kind of like friendship. Like you have to co-sign on that. You can't just be like, hey, I'm your friend. If the other person's like, mm, 
I don't know, we only like, like, like each other's stuff on social media. So yeah. that idea of allyship, um, which is really popular in um, social justice spaces and people wanting to claim that or people, you know, wearing a, a pride pin or going to a march, really, that's more performative, I think, if it's not backed up by the inner work that you were that you mentioned. So for me, the inner work is really diving into and dissecting how I was raised, you know, the programming for my parents, but also for my educators. Um, and then how that influenced the way I categorize and um, how I see the world through a very specifically white lens and what that means. And again, I, I grew up thinking that I saw the world as neutral, you know, like that I did not have a racialized lens at all. But of course, I see and saw everything through a white filter. So having awareness of that for me is part of the inner work. And that means just even though I can say like, I'd never had a black teacher growing up. Well, now I'm an adult and it is my responsibility to re-educate myself. So what does that look like? And I make it very intentional. I just set aside um, 30 minutes to an hour every day of reading or, um, you know, communication. I have a, I have an awesome community here in Carlsbad. Um, and that has changed my view completely. I think there's no way to really bypass the education piece when you're an ally. And then it also helps you peel back the layers of like those reflexive biases, the things that we really want to avoid acknowledging, like the the shameful parts of ourselves that we'd rather just put our defensive up and say, oh, no, no, of course I don't believe that. But really being honest about stereotypes that I've um, absorbed and how they've impacted the way I've treated people, hired people, like gone through the gone through my own world. Um, and in our work as the kinswomen, we focus on the interpersonal um, relationships. Like we have these massive structures that we are not really attempting to break down. And we also think that for aspiring allies, that's way too overwhelming to feel motivated. So we start on a person to person basis. And um, I said aspiring towards allyship because I, I don't think that for me, it's like, there's or any other ally, there's a point of arrival where we're like, okay, we're done. We got to the top of the ladder. We get our allyship bin net pin and we don't need to do anything else. <laughs> like, you know, we have a diverse friend group. We've, we, um, you know, hired uh, people of color on our team and we donate to this organization. Like we're good. It's just so much more holistic and interpersonal and individual than that. So yeah, that's a, a peek into my inner work that is, will always be ongoing. Wow. I know we, um, so we both live in San Diego uh, and in Carlsbad specifically. Yeah. And um, I was really excited to hear about this book because we actually live in, you know, a part of the country that actually is not very diverse. It's a yeah. lot less diverse for me than mm -hmm. the places that I've, the other places that I live and other places that, um, uh, you know, and where I grew up specifically in Brooklyn, which is incredibly mm -hmm. diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been interesting. I've been here for 11 years and it's been very interesting to build community here in San Diego um, and to have these very you know, sometimes very difficult conversations yeah. with my friends. I have uh, a, a beautiful community here in San Diego and have built some really, you know, lifelong friendships. And that conversation is a conversation that has had to happen, you know, many, many times. And it's not a one-time conversation. It's the ways that we can interact with each other and build relationship and show mm -hmm. and express love for each other by better understanding who we each are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's kind of, so on one hand, it's like, who am I beneath the kind of lens through which the world sees me? And who are you beneath yeah. the, the lens through which the world sees you so that we can really understand each other? Because not every white 
you know, person is the same, nor is every Black person or, you know, every person of color the same. We're all different. And that's a part of our identity. In some ways, it can be a large part of our identity, but there's also so much more. So I think that if people look at understanding who we are, it helps to get through the door of having those harder conversations about how I live in the world and how other people do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I One of the things that my partner says, Izu says a lot is, she's like, it's not my job to convince you that mm-hmm. I am worth humanity. She's like, you're restoring the humanity that's been robbed through white, our white supremacist society. Today's episode is brought to you by a transformative and healing workshop designed exclusively for women, the Shape Your Foundation Retreat for Women in the Family. Are you seeking to break free from the overwhelm, burnout, and emotional turmoil that have been passed down through generations? Are you ready to heal, grow, and create a healthier family environment for you and your loved ones? Join me, Lisan Basquiat, former corporate executive, life strategist, and the founder of Shaping Freedom, as I guide you through a three-day retreat focused on personal growth and building a solid foundation within your family. Over the course of this immersive experience, you'll learn how to identify your values and beliefs to better understand your family's patterns, how to set clear boundaries, and to improve your communication style, how to address and heal from generational trauma. Bring along a female family member or a friend who also wants to embark on this important personal growth journey. And on the final day, we'll celebrate your progress together with a special brunch hosted by me. Don't miss this incredible opportunity to forge a new path for yourself and for your family. To reserve your spot, visit our website at shapingfreedom.com or click on the link in the show notes. Together, let's shape a strong foundation for ourselves and for our families and create a lasting legacy of love, support, and understanding. Yeah, it's been an interesting transition moving here um, to Carlsbad from New York. Mm -hmm. But I've been really encouraged by... In some ways, the, the smaller scale of the city makes it easier to get involved. And because I work from home, it was I really needed to be intentional about finding community out here and people that I could connect with. And I joined an organization called the Carlsbad Equality Coalition that does amazing work here with the schools, the mayor's office, the local police department. But I had, I, I write about this in the book. It's, you know, it, it, it's obviously very motivating for me as the wife of a Black man and the friend of Black friends and hopefully the future mother of Black children, biracial children, um, or however it happens. You know, I'm open, you know, to whatever God's plan is. Um, but that that this is a beautiful, safe place for all people. And I had this experience um, last summer where Dave, my husband and I were talking and I was, I was like telling him what, like what kind of sunscreen to wear. And I was really like digging my heels into it. And he was like, you need to stop policing my black body. And like, Mm. you know, chill. He's like, you don't have black skin. Like, don't tell me what sunscreen to wear. And it was this moment, obviously not easy to hear as a partner, but it's, it's, it was clarifying for me in the sense that here I am like working with the Carlsbad Equality Coalition on de-escalation practices with our local PD, like reaching like across the aisle to connect with the um, police chief over coffee and, you know, create these relationships. But in my own partnership, that's what really matters, you know, is that daily interpersonal 
interaction with the person that I love the most. So I think it's also so important for us to recognize like where there's that mismatch between who we want to be and who we're actually being. And that's not an easy thing to look at for anybody, you know, like how we act versus what our value, what we say our values are. So that's the journey that I've been on. <laughs> Again, not always the funnest, right? <laughs> of course, of course. You know, I, it, you know, it popped up for me, which is, you know, kind of funny. I uh, was dating this guy and um, he made a comment to me about, you know, I wrap my hair up at night because if I don't, it's like, you know, crazy town. And so I wrap my hair at night and I just, there's something also very comforting about wrapping my head. And so anyway, so I wrap up my hair and, um, and I, uh, you know, was putting a scarf on my head or something. And he made some comment, like, you don't have to wear a scarf. And I said, but I do. And he's like, you don't need to wear a scarf on your head. And I felt so like annoyed. And this was a black man. And I was like, who are you to tell me what to do with my hair? Like, you don't, you know, like you don't know anything about my hair. Like, don't wrap your hair, but don't worry about my hair. And uh, and that's kind of what came to mind. It's like, you know, understanding another person's perspective, yeah. uh, which in many ways, along a lot of different topics, is something that a lot of us find a little challenging sometimes to deal with because we, through love and mm -hmm. through like, have a lot of opinions and suggestions and yes. ways that we want to influence those folks that are around us. Yes. And it really is about understanding what the boundary is mm -hmm. and whether or not we fully understand before giving a person a suggestion about what we believe they should be doing with their life, their hair, their skin, their, you know, body, you know, whatever yes. the thing is. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's what I really love about the approach that you and Izu took uh, you know, with the book is that, again, it's not just about the kind of catchy phrases, it's do your inner work. Like this mm -hmm. is about looking into who you are and yeah. how you're showing up in the world. And by taking this, this very vulnerable and courageous um, story that you and Izu have pulled together, it gives a person the opportunity to think about the ways that they're looking at the difference in skin tone and life experience and how we show up, how we're, how we're looked at and valued culturally, but also to really took a, take a look at who you are mm -hmm. and how you're showing up in the world and what kind of boundaries you're willing to respect and understand within yourself so mm -hmm. that you can show up in relationships in a way that is more productive. Yes. Yes, exactly. Because if we can't show up as our full selves in a relationship, how true is it? How honest is it? So it's such a gift. And thank you for those kind words. It's been such a gift to do this work with kinswomen and to open up parts of myself too, and then invite other people to do the same. And I hope that's what this book accomplishes. Like, hey, I know these are conversations we typically shy away from, but if we can just put all the messiness and discomfort out there, and just lean into it, then hopefully you can do it too. And what's on the other side of that is so, so beautiful. Absolutely. I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, Kingswomen. Kinswomen. Kinswomen. And I'd love to hear, like, what is Kinswomen? And I know that you're having the conversations and I know that there is community there and there's a yes. platform for open mm -hmm. conversation. But tell, share a little bit more about what you two are doing through this um, organization. Sure. So we started it um, in 2019. We're about four years old, and it began with the in-person living room conversations that have since moved to places like Zoom. But we also started our podcast in 2019, where we've been able to have incredible conversations with people across the spectrum of identity about who they are, how they show up in the world, how they bridge the gaps in their own life. and those have been so illuminating and those our guests have been some of my my most amusing teachers so aside from the podcast we obviously have our book which we are 
that's our main focus right now to, is promoting it. I'm, I'm sure you know what it takes to promote a book and and all the all the things that must be done. So that's been really fun to to finally have the book out in the world. But um, before we published the book, we were hosting classes on being an anti racist entrepreneur. We were working with. Um, individuals and corporations. I had had a lot of friends reach out to me in 2020 and say, hey, I see that you are um, doing this work. Can, like, what what can I do? Like, tell me what to do immediately. There's no easy answer or magic bullet to being anti-racist in your life. But we started having, um, you know, private conversations with um you know, people who have very powerful in positions of power who have a lot of influence, which was exciting. Sometimes people would approach us just to say, um, hey, can I basically book an hour long therapy session for you with you both? I need to hear a white woman and a black woman's perspective on this particular issue. Um, we've worked with nonprofits. We've worked with schools. Um, you know, I've gone back to my old sorority and just, you know, did a training with them about, um, you know, how to, how, how our sisterhood could be more inclusive. This work has really touched every aspect of our lives, my life and my life in particular. Um, but we also are, we, we want to share with people like we exist outside of our partnership and we, um, we have other interests too, but for me, this has been a beautiful, life-changing place for people to come together and just, yeah, begin to build trust between women of color and white women and to have these conversations that never get had. And I think through the frameworks that we write about in our book and we talk about in the podcast, I want, you know, coming from corporate, I want everyone, you know, every white person in corporate America to, you know, read this book. I want everyone who's ever been in like a bridal party or on a bachelorette party to that's been all white to read this book. Um, anybody who has kids or, you know, goes to school to read this book. The framework, I think, while it's obviously not universal and it, it won't work for everything, um, we can't have this we can't get to justice if we don't have the space to talk and talk honestly. So that's really what Kinswoman is all about is just building cross, building cross racial trust and, and bridging gaps. And I'd love for it to grow beyond us. Like it's big, way bigger than just the two of us, you know, me and Izu, it, anyone can be their own Kinswoman or, or find their kins people. I know you talk about in the book about four foundations. Um, yeah. Could you share a little bit about what they are and maybe a little teeny bit about um, what they mean? Yes. So we have four foundations that we think are the tenants to building trust, really in any relationship. But when it comes to allyship, I think there's a lot of stress, guilt, um, defensiveness that we forget how simple it is not necessarily easy, but simple to build trust. And the first one is time. The second is transparency and then consistency and communication. So it's two T's and two C's. That's how I remember it. And with time, we build trust over time, just like we would in any relationship. Your relationship with your partner or your best friend didn't happen instantly. And so from an allyship framework, we have to recognize whenever we're trying to be an ally or attempting or aspiring towards allyship, we sometimes think, oh, okay, I've done one good thing. I should instantly be trusted as an ally or as a quote unquote good person. Um, but that really isn't respecting the time that trust takes to build like in any relationship. And then transparency is being vulnerable, having the courage to learn in public. For me, I never feel 100% comfortable talking about this stuff. And I think that's okay. You know, I fear messing up and I know I will mess up and yet I just keep going. And we need that kind of transparency to get to trust. The third is consistency. We saw so many empty promises or one and done box checks in the summer of 2020 that now, you know, people people have really fallen to the wayside when it comes to all the promises they made about allyship. 
in 2020. And this work requires consistency. We are not expecting constant outrage. We know that's um, not sustainable. We know that urgency can also be very toxic, but this work in building trust requires consistency, just like with any friend. Like you call them, you check in, you know, um, you make sure that those bonds are, are still strong. And then lastly, it's communication, which is pretty self explanatory, but um, we overlook it sometimes just creating space to have a hard conversation. In your workplace, are you creating time and space to listen to what your employees are telling you? Or like going back to the example you gave about wrapping your hair, you know, your boyfriend didn't ask what you needed or wanted. And I didn't ask my husband, hey, what do you want in this situation? What do you need? Just yeah. having that, having space for communication is so key. So those are the four foundations that we really see to building trust in any relationship. But we, of course, are focusing on building cross-racial trust in our book. Wonderful. You know, in 2020, and I'm going to ask you in a moment uh, to share a little bit about your friendship and what was happening in 2020, if, you, if you're willing to. Yeah. But I remember... Um, talking to a friend and this friend is someone who I love so much and she is one of the most beautiful human beings that I, I've ever met, pure and just wonderful. And she's a white woman. And um, I remember when, uh, and 2020 was crazy, we all know, because there was a lot going on. It was like political, it was public health, it was race, it was like social justice, it was crazy. And I remember after, um, uh, George Floyd was killed and she called me. We were talking about something else. We had scheduled some time to chat and we were chatting on a video conference line. And I remember her saying to me, I was kind of talking to her about my frustration about what was going on, about just the craziness of that chapter in our world history. And I remember her looking at me and saying, I'm so sorry. And I burst out crying and I said to her, that's the thing. And I couldn't talk like I cry, like before I could even get the words out. Um, I just felt this welling up about so many things and I needed a minute to kind of like get my words together. And I remember saying to her, um, that's the problem. You know, you're sorry, which what that what that means to me, what I'm hearing is that you're looking at my situation. You know, if you were going to a funeral, you're consoling me for my loss. And what hurts is that what I believe is that you and I should be consoling each other because of this horrific and horrible thing that is happening and 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 has become such a part of the day-to-day -day experience, you know, against another human being. And so until we can together look at this situation, not as my problem as a Black woman, but as our problem, you know, with, you know, what's happening, you know, with the percentage of, you know, police officers who are doing this kind of thing, um, you know, that was what I was really grieving in that moment. Um, and it really, you know, with Hera Hub Carlsbad that I know you know that I own here, I remember during that time there was a group that started and it was really around allyship and having those conversations. And there was a group of women who came together within the community to have some of those conversations and sometimes to just vent and cry or, you know, be enraged or talk about, you know, what they, you know, what, what they wanted to do to make things a little bit better. Um, what was, so here you are, it's wow. 2020, you've just formed this thing in 2019. Mm -hmm. This is like where I want to, you know, in a few minutes, <laughs> kind of like, what was going on? Like, what mm -hmm. were some of the conversations that were happening? And I'd also love to get some insight into yours and Izu's friendship. Mm -hmm. Like, what were some of those conversations between you two? What, what did all of that do for... Yeah you know, for your friendship and for yeah. the intimacy of your friendship. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Um, yes, it's crazy to reflect back on that time because it was so recent, but 
it was so, yeah, it was just so intense um, for all of us. But during that time, you know, we'd launched Kinswomen 2019. I left my job in January, 2020. It was a podcast. Oh. And um, I thought this, it, we're just going to grow the podcast. You know, I'd worked in ad sales. I thought we'll get some sponsors and we will figure it out from there. And then in May, June of 2020, people just came out of the woodwork asking to pick our brains, um, asking um, Izu specifically to like sit on boards and to um, guide people. And, you know, it, it was a crazy time. I remember there was an editor in chief that I used to work with and I wrote her this email in response to a post. I, I wrote her an email, basically, I think, no, it was in response to her silence. And um, the way I, the way I try to use my white privilege is just talking to other white people, you know, um, about, about this stuff, because unfortunately when people are on the beginning of their allyship journey, white people sometimes can only understand and only want to hear, even if they don't say it out loud from another white person. Um, it's definitely a, a flaw in our empathy, but, I remember this editor in chief, I wrote her this email saying, you know, why as a leader, I felt like she couldn't be silent during that time. And she copy and pasted my email and put it in the, um, as her, um, caption of an Instagram post, like with no Ooh. credit, with no credit whatsoever. Oh, wow. And I was like, this is all kinds wrong. And I, you know, I called her out for that. But on so many levels. Yeah. 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 And but it was so many things like that, you know, just people trying to do these um, super reactive knee jerk things to to perform allyship, you know, that I'm a good person. And there are certain things where just like, you know, there's just way more nu nuance. Um, we were living in New York at the time and I had white friends, you know, who were texting me, hey, do you want to come with me to this Black Lives Matter march? Um, and can I stay at your house because it's near your apartment? And, you know, I'm living with my husband at the time and he's like, COVID is still happening. It's 2020. I don't want to risk that person's going to a march. They're not coming into our home. So it's like, I'm not marching because I'm keeping, I'm respecting my husband's wishes and keeping him safe and keeping our, our home safe in the best way we knew how at the time. And so, you know, so many contradictions, so much, um, so much pain for me. I didn't react in the best way, Lasan. I was angry. Like, I think when you wake up as a white person to racial injustice, it can be so easy to point at others and be like, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Instead of looking in the mirror and being like, okay, but what can I do? Like, what is my responsibility here? So there was a lot of that for me. And our friendship between me and Izu, there were hard times. You know, she had to call me in and be like, hey, when you said, you know, X, Y, Z, it you know, it wasn't great. Um, or why did you say this? And it's, it's easier for me now, but you know, cause we've been working together for four years and she happily and easily challenges me on everything. And it's just a, you know, part of our relationship. Um, but in the beginning it was really hard at the same time, we were probably never closer during that time because we, spent almost every day together. We were building this thing that we were not sure what it would be, um, but we just knew that we wanted to help people and pre provide some space where they could, you know, have these dialogues. So it's evolved since then. And uh, we were in each other's, you know, pod squad during COVID. So we got to see each other all the time. Um, and then we both decided to leave New York. And then it's been a little bit harder to, to, we've had to, to be more intentional about maintaining our relationship over Zoom and and over visits. But that was a crazy time. Um, I learned a lot. You know, it's hard. I'm ever evolving as an ally. And we've been writing the book since 2020. And it's 2023. And I feel vastly different sometimes from month to month. Where I look, I look back at what I wrote in the book or something that we, you know, used to talk about or post about on social media. And I'm like, I actually feel differently now. And I'm not going to 
like try to judge myself or shame myself for where I was at in my allyship journey at that time because that's where I was at. Um, and I, but I'm just honoring my evolution. But yeah, it's happening. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a steep learning curve <laughs> for sure. I commend you for being willing to take it. You know, I think we are, and again, I think this is what makes this so interesting to me, um, is that it is, yes, about race. And yes, it's about friendship and how friends can talk about this topic that is so um, hard to talk about. Um, sometimes because it's not the past. It's, it's part of the culture and what's happening in the world today in, in many ways. Um, and it's not moving. The needle's not moving as quickly as, uh, as many of us would like. And it really is as much a conversation about that as your book also points to the ways that human beings can have deeper relationships with each other and more, more authentic conversation, you know, because I think that that is really the way that we make um, inroads with the things that this world, that our society is challenged with. It's by having those real hard conversations, not ignoring it, you know, but really facing it and having the conversations, even when we don't necessarily agree or see it the same way. You know, because we are all coming to the conversation with our own, you know, experience. You know, I think that first understanding that we are all individually very unique human beings who are living this experience within a culture that programs us in certain ways. But ultimately, it's about me being willing to know more about who you are and you being willing to know more about who I am so that we can speak each other's language. Yes. You know, and see each other, you know, as real human beings, because we're not, the world is not just evenly divided along the lines of like the color of your skin, the color of my skin. You know, I'm a black woman born in Brooklyn, bred in Brooklyn, Haitian father, Puerto Rican mother. You know, you're a woman from Allentown, Pennsylvania, married to a black man. You know, our experiences are different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and in this book, we really encourage people to lean into the messiness and the discomfort that our the soup of our identity is, you know, creates sometimes. I through the through the writing of this book, I was inquiring into myself, what is my capacity for discomfort, period, you know, and having uncomfortable conversations with another? setting boundaries. Um, I, I write about how I was nervous to tell somebody who cut my hair that I didn't like the haircut. And if I don't have the capacity to speak up at the hairdresser, how am I going to speak up, you know, when it's really important, (laughs) you know, or when the stakes are a lot higher. And I also, um, write about how I avoid, you know, for people who are first approaching these, these conversations, because I know that they can be really uncomfortable. Um, any conversation about identity and the way our, our identities differ can be uncomfortable. If it's too much, or if it's not really safe or appropriate to have those conversations with another yet, then just look at the ways that you're avoiding uncomfortable conversations in your own life as it pertains to worth or sex or money or body, or anything that's a little bit taboo in our culture. Like I recognize that I had so much money, shame, and trauma, in, in, and just wanted to avoid conversations about money um, when it, with, with Dave. And I just thought, okay, how can facing this help me, help my, expand my capacity to live in the discomfort and get to the growth in other areas too. So I think that's, yeah, it's having the willingness to just lean in a little bit to like that juiciness, the juiciness of the discomfort that we always want to shy away from. Exactly. But it's so good. It hurts so bad. It really does. It really does. You know, I think, you know, um, how you do one thing is how you do every single thing in your Mm -hmm. life. Mm-hmm. And I think that this offers an opportunity to look at just one thing 
in your life and then to take that learning and apply it to other areas of your life, which I love, again, which is another one of the many reasons why I really appreciate this work that you all are doing, because it really is as much a lesson in how people can build friendships through difference as it is a lesson in really having the courage to allow a mirror to be held up you know, to your face and and to Mm -hmm. your life and to how you're looking at things. Because if you can master or if you're willing to sink into um, doing your inner work around allyship or around having better relationships and deeper relationships with friends, you can then also take that and apply it to your willingness, like you said, to look at Mm -hmm. your relationship with money, your relationship with your man or woman, your Mm -hmm. relationship with your parents and your children and other things that are happening in your life. So I think that you've created this conversation and you and Izu have written this story uh, and are, are, are helping people to understand through using racism or race or friendship as an example, but you can apply it anywhere. Um, So I really commend both of you for that. And I think that as much as, you know, 2020 was such a cray cray year, you know, filled with a lot of BS and nonsense, it also was the birth of a lot of really great conversations that may not be happening otherwise, like this book that you've written or, um, you know, other conversations that have happened, the exhibition that my sister and I pulled together, that really came out of like, it's 2020. What do we, what the things that our brother was talking about, you know, 35, 40 years ago are still, unfortunately, very much a part of what's happening in the world. So, Mm -hmm. you know, bravo to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Lasan. Thank you. It means so much to me that you saw something in this book um, that's universal, but also specific. And I'm just so grateful to have met you and to be connected. And I really appreciate chatting with you and, and you having me on Shaping Freedom. Thank you. You've connected me to, uh, you connected me to Mashonda. Yes. You know, yes. And it's so strange because I yes. knew of you way before I ever actually met you. I think that you and Nishanda, when well, Nishanda moved here, you had some conversation about, you know, who was in the area. And I think you had been to Hera Hub and you yes. connected us. And so, yes. you know, I think that's what being kinswomen is really about. It's about us supporting each other and loving each other and wanting to go deeper with each other. Um, to understand what this journey of being a woman is really all about on this planet, you know, yes. in this chapter in our world history, you know. Yes, it is. It is a unique one to live through, absolutely. absolutely. And I thank you for creating these, like these spaces for women through Hera Hub and through this podcast, not just women, um, to have this conversation. And I also want to shout out Keisha, who introduced. Us te- well, technically, we're connected in a couple of ways. That's but right. She That's introduced right. me to Hera Hub, and that's um, right, she did. Yes, and and brought me. So, I loved. You know, I didn't know what to expect moving here from New York. We moved here sight and seen just to get out of the city during the pandemic, and I'm so grateful for the incredible women that I have met and incredible people that I've met out here. So, thank you. I'm I'm very grateful. Wow, I'm really glad you're here. I'm uh, uh, Keisha Lee Inche. Uh, Keisha Lee is actually who uh, Hannah's referring to. She is the founder of uh, Striking Statements. And what Keisha does is she helps people to really embody who they are in the brand that they are exposing the world to. And so she does really beautiful work around um, helping people who are entrepreneurs to get more comfortable uh, with their brand and with the way that they're showing up for their organizations. And so um, that's who Hannah is referring to. Uh, so this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so, so much. And I'd love to uh, find a way for us to talk some more. I'd love for you and Izu, I'd love to have yes, like a, we must make a it chance happen. to 
like really to like as a part two at some point, whenever, you know, time permits, whenever we can figure it out. But I would really love to talk to you and Izu a little bit more about your friendship and about your journey on, you know, uh, on this road that you're on. Tell me, tell us how, like, so kin, kins women, how can people support you? What, what do you need? Thank you. Right now we're, we're focusing on the book. Our heart and soul is in this book, Real Friends Talk About Race, which you can get anywhere. It's available via hardcover wherever you get your books, but you can also listen to it as an audiobook or read it on a Kindle. So, um, you know, we just, even if you, if you don't want to buy it, requesting it from the library makes a big difference too. And supporting no, it. No, no, no. We way. want people to buy the book. We want okay, people yes. to buy the book. We want people to buy the book. We want women who want to have this conversation and really, um, uh, uh um, dive into this very juicy topic around, uh, the ways that we're showing up, we want them to create book clubs around it and to have conversation around it and to get their friends and tell more friends, buy this book. The name of the book is Real Friends Talk About Race. And it was written by Hannah Summerhill and Izu Mukantabana. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, two friends who decided to find a way to bridge the gaps between them uh, through creating this extraordinary conversation that they facilitate through Kinswomen, uh, this podcast that they've created where they are continuing that conversation, and now this book that they've co-authored around the same topic of bridging the gap between people and also helping uh, women to really hold a mirror up, look at themselves so that they can show up more authentically in the lives and communities that they have. So Hannah, thank you so much. Thank you so for much. For a Lisa. really warm and juicy conversation. I appreciate it. And I hope that we can figure out a part two and I'd love for it to be, you know, with you and your partner. Absolutely. We're speaking it into existence. It would be great Absolutely. Um, when we come, hopefully we'll do a West Coast book tour and we can do a live event at Hera Hub. That would be amazing. It would also be great for us to maybe host a kinswoman conversation out of Hera Hub Carlsbad. I would love uh, that. So yeah, so we will figure that one out. Uh, but for now, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. This was great. Thank you so much. It was so great. You had such great questions. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful conversation. And that, my dear friends, brings us to the end of another enriching episode of Shaping Freedom with Lisan Basquiat. My heartfelt thanks goes out to Hannah Summerhill for joining us today, for her openness, her bravery, and the profound insights she shared from her experiences and work with the Kinswomen and through her book, Real Friends Talk About Race. Our conversation reminds us that the path to understanding and empathy often lies through the difficult talks, the ones that shake us, that challenge us, and ultimately the ones that help us to grow. I hope that this conversation inspires you to have your own conversations about race and other sensitive topics with your friends, your family, and your community. From this conversation, there were three points that really stood out to me. One, we really must recognize the impact of culture and how we were programmed in our personal history in order to truly get a clear understanding of our relationship with race and racism. There really is no one-size-fits-all experience for any of us. Second, it's important to take the time to self-reflect and to go inward so you can better understand your own deep-rooted beliefs and programming. Keep the ones that light up your life. And please, friends, be willing to discard the ones that keep you in the dark and disconnected from your humanity. Finally, to be accountable for cultivating your own empathy, vulnerability, courage, and to create a willingness to really listen is key to promoting acceptance, understanding, and real connection. Have the hard conversations, y'all. 
There is such a juiciness that you can only access once you've had the courage to have real talk. From San Diego, this is Lisan Basquiat, encouraging you to keep shaping your freedom and to never shy away from the conversations that matter. Until our next episode, stay safe, stay curious, and keep the dialogue going. Goodbye for now.